All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Kathy McBride. It's September 13, 2022. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield University. Kathy, thank you so much for joining us Thanks today. Thanks for having me. Uh, the first question to get things started is why wine? Oh, this might be the longest answer. <laughs> um, I used to work for Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, so as a hospitality person, um, and became, I was in food and beverage, and became obsessed with flavour. So I was at the chefs all the time. I'm sure I was the most annoying staff member because I was like, why did you put that spice with that meat? And why did you put that herb with that fish? And I was constantly in the kitchen, like, why, 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 why? But I worked a lot of breakfast and lunch where, and we didn't get a lot of international wine, so I didn't have a lot of exposure. And then Australia very slowly started to get international wines and some exposure to international wines. And the first time it happened, I was in our fine dining restaurant at the Four Seasons in Sydney and I tasted a Chardonnay from the US and a Chardonnay from Australia and a Chardonnay from France. And I don't even know why we had all those things open or how I got to taste them all in one day. And I was like, what the? And my head almost exploded. And then I went straight to the sommelier and I was like, why? These are all Chardonnay. Why are they all so different? And he went for a pretty deep dive. I was pretty lucky into the possibilities as to why they might be different. And that was kind of it. That was my turning point. Um, but I stayed with Four Seasons for another eight years after that, travelled the world, all in food and beverage, um, but obviously travelling got a lot more exposure into wine and somehow along the, the way got this idea in my head that I wanted to make it. I don't know why. I did, it wasn't good enough just to sell it or taste it, I wanted to make it. And so um, I had a few goals with Four Seasons. One was to get to 15 years service. Um, one was to work in a country where English was not the first language, which happened, and then one was to be director. So I became director of conference services in the Four Seasons in Costa Rica, and I hit my 15-year goal all in one spot in one year. And so I went to the GM with my envelope in my hands, and I knocked on his door and walked in, and he saw the envelope, and he said, no, absolutely <laughs> not. I don't accept that. Whatever it is, I don't accept it. And then I told him what I wanted to do, and he's like, how could I say no? So the plan was I went back to school. So I was a mature age student. I got into every university that offers the course in Australia because I fit all these like minority groups. They're like, yes, come. <laughs> you are female, you are old, you are <laughs> like, you're all the things. So I got into all three, made a decision to go to um, Curtin University, which is in Western Australia. And the reason I chose that was there were a few easy ones. So. Um, the, the uni in Wagga Wagga, which is in New South Wales. A lot of people go there, but the year that I applied, they switched it from full-time to part-time. So I was going to have to do part-time online eight years. And I was like, nope, definitely not. And how do you make wine online? Like, I was very confused about that situation. Um, so then I was down to two, Roseworthy in South Australia, which has the most impeccable reputation. It's, it's considered the best wine school in Australia. Their professors are professors. They're very, very intellectual and educational, and it's it's a fantastic course. Then there's Curtin in WA. I'd never been to WA, but the teachers at Curtin University are all winemakers, and their job is being a winemaker, and they just teach because they love it, mm -hmm. whereas the teachers at Roseworthy are professors. Mm -hmm. Their job is to be teachers, and I'm like, I want to learn from the guys that are in the field. So I ended up in Western Australia, learning how to make wine. <laughs> Amazing. So I'm gonna come back and we'll pick it up there in a second, but I wanna back up a little bit. Tell yeah. me, you mentioned Four Seasons. Yes. Tell me about life before. Tell me about uh, uh, upbringing, oh. growing up, and, and how you ended up at Four Seasons. <laughs> okay, so I grew up um, in, in the very outskirt suburbs of Sydney, in Australia, uh, in the dodgy bit. I always <laughs> like to say that, because it was, it was uh, you know, government-assisted housing, and my mum was a single parent, and she, struggled really hard to get us the education and, and the opportunities that we got. Um, so I went into, at a not too young age, but I was about seven and I went into gymnastics and just fell in love with it. I went to look at it actually and just walked myself straight through that door and joined in. So then my mum had to find out where you pay for the class because I was already in it. <laughs> so I loved gym. Um, and right through high school, I actually was coaching gymnastics. So that was my very first job. I was a gymnastics coach. So, and this will all actually tie in, which is strange, because my, right from that very young age, my whole life has been about balance. 
and so filigreen stone which is the brand um, for me is also all about balance but uh, yeah that'll all be evident <laughs> as we move through so yeah I became a gymnastics coach got to the top of my game at like 19 years of age I've been coaching at that stage for six years so I was coaching kids for the Olympics I had a number of, of gymnasts down at the Australian Institute of Sport we used to go down there every three months for, you know, just for check-ins and make sure that we were on track. Um, I was allowed to go to school late and pick up kids, like I would leave school early, so I was like half an hour either end of my high school years. As long as I did the work at home, I was allowed to, you know, not be there. So, yeah, from a really young age, I was I was pretty ambitious, I guess. But then 19, where do you go after that? I mean, I was like, what am I going to do? This is kind of this is it do I want to continue to do this and one of my friends is like well you really like traveling you should do something like hospitality ended up in a in a random you know private college course I I was not excited about uni I was a super shy kid and uni just felt way too big for me so I applied for a much smaller class a much smaller kind of you know more um, I don't even know how to describe it it was just a very focused hospitality course in a private um, post-secondary college, I guess you'd call it. Um, it wasn't a university, it was, it was a private version of, of a uni. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of that, you had to do 600 hours work experience, which is a lot in 12 months. It was only a 12 month course. Um, so I applied everywhere and you know, pizza joints and any hospitality, it didn't have to be something specific, you could apply anywhere. Um, and in Australia, when you apply for a job, they have to keep your details for three months after your application. It's just a, an employment mm -hmm. rule or law. And I applied at the Four Seasons because I had um, a food and beverage job going and I didn't get it. Obviously, I had no experience. <laughs> I don't know why I thought I could get a job at a beautiful hotel. But anyway, Four Seasons called me back 10 weeks after my original application. So they only had to keep my application for two more weeks. And they said, we've got a job in our gym. Do you want it? Mm -hmm. So I was like, that's actually something I know. Yes, I want that job. And in amongst that, as part of the duties of folding towels and signing in members to the fancy Four Seasons gym, I trained our top eight um, executives. They're called the planning committee. And I did their, all of their fitness programs for them. <laughs> and after that, and all their wives were very happy, I kind of got to choose whatever I wanted to do. So I was like, I wouldn't mind trying food and beverage. And I ended up in room service and the rest is history. You mentioned the chance to travel to a lot of different places. So mm -hmm. tell me about where some of the different places you worked, maybe some of the highlights of the places you worked and maybe favorite memories of that time in your life. Oh gosh. So my first Four Seasons travel experience, um, we shut the hotel down in Sydney for a refurbishment because the Sydney 2000 Olympics were coming. We were the official Olympic Hotel, which meant we had the whole IOC and all of the royal families from all over the world, and the hotel was not in the right shape physically. And they're like, okay, we, to get it done fast enough, we've got to shut it down. And what you were supposed to do was stay home, but be on call. And I was like, I cannot stay home. I will die of boredom. So I <laughs> said, well, can I just go to a different Four Seasons? There are so many, surely someone needs help. And they're like, if you can find the Four Seasons that needs the help, we'll let you go done and I was like well I've got friends in London I'm gonna see if it's available so I just called the Four Seasons they hooked me up with all of the contacts and, and who to speak to and all those things and I said this is my experience do you need help and they said we are desperate we've got three international sporting events this summer we'll have you for somewhere between four and six months when can you arrive and I was like great so that was my first um, experience with traveling with Four Seasons and I the highlight of, of being over there apart from you know being with my mates was that I made an agreement when I first got there with the boss of room service, I, ended, I was in room service, um, that I would work for as many hours, four days in a row every week, but please could I have a three day weekend? And whatever tips I made in those four days, I used to travel the other three days. So sometimes I would go to Scotland and sometimes I would go to Paris <laughs> or Italy or wherever the money got me. That was my highlight of, of England. Um, then I went back home, did the Olympics, um, and then I thought it would be really cool to do an opening because it's when you work for, for hotels, particularly big ones with international, um, an international footprint, 
the kind of pinnacle and the way that you can get places is to do openings. Um, and we were opening a hotel in uh, Whistler in Canada. Mm. And so I applied for that job. I wasn't, by that stage I was in uh, conferences and events and I had to take a bit of a demotion to get there. But to do the opening, I was like, I'll do it. Um, yeah, so I was back in the restaurant and, and had never seen snow in my life. And I remember the first time it snowed, I was staring out the window of my house and I called my mum, I'm like, mum, it's snowing. And she goes, why are you whispering? I'm like, because it's so quiet. It's so quiet. It's so beautiful and magical. Anyways, three hours later, it's still snowing. And I call her back, it's still snowing. This is amazing. So I learned to snowboard there. Um, that was probably my highlight. And I did a lot of travel through, through Canada too, which mm -hmm. is super fun. Um, and while I was in Canada, I looked after a prince from Saudi Arabia. He is one of the owners of Four Seasons um, and one of the richest men in the world. At the time, he was number four. Four. Yeah, I think he's dropped to about number seven or eight now, but still doing okay. <laughs> um, so just the way that my career went, I planned his trip because I was in conference services, which is kind of the planning of events mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and group business. So I planned it, I did the whole back side of the program and then I got um, a transfer down to banquet. So I did the front side of the program too. So I knew his needs inside and out. Um, so he um, travels a lot obviously with Four Seasons and was going to Costa Rica and Costa Rica called Whistler and they called my boss and they were like, hey, we need you to come down. We've got this guy coming and we, we need help. We have a very island mentality and we're going to need some help. And my boss said, you don't need me, you need Kathy. So they sent me to Costa Rica. I fell in love with it. Um, the second I stepped off the plane, I'm like, this is where I want to be. Got the program done and that was fine. But I said to the GM at the time, I will be back. I don't care if I have to pot wash. I will be back in this hotel. And within nine months, the position became available that eventually finished my career, mm -hmm. which yeah, so crazy. Um, yeah. So amazing. It's nuts. <laughs> it's an amazing chapter of life. It's, it's all been amazing, actually. Yeah, I've had a very fortunate life. So you've, you've you developed this interest in passion and, and food and mm -hmm. wine and flavor and all of that, and it leads you down this idea of, I'm going to make wine. So yeah. tell me about the experience of going back to school at that point and of, of starting to learn how to make wine. OK. It's a science degree. I didn't even do science in high school. So I was, I was rightly very nervous. <laughs> but my very first class was Chem 101. So the way that they have the, the degree structured in WA is every single st science student in that university does their first year pretty much together. So you've got marine biologists, you've got people who want to be doctors, you've got geologists, and you've got 10 winemakers. <laughs> So out of thousands and thousands of science students, I didn't meet another winemaking student probably until f fourth semester in that class. But my very first class was Chem 101 and I was in a thousand seat lecture theatre with nobody I knew and a bunch of 17 year olds who all knew the material and I knew nothing. I'd never even seen a periodic table. And I sat there and I was like, what have you done? <laughs> and why, why are you doing this? But in the end, the science is actually part of, it's almost my favorite part of it. I love the aspect that there are all these natural kind of things happening both in the vineyard and in the soil and with rain and sun and all those things. And it, it transforms into this completely separate type of science in the winery. So going from the biology of the natural situation into the chemistry of the making of the wine is, to me, I still get fascinated by it every day. And that's, I mean, that's the, the stuff that you have to continue to learn because Mother Nature continues to change everything for us. So, yeah, that's, that's part of why I love it because mm -hmm. no year is the same, no vintage is mm -hmm. similar. It doesn't matter where you do it, it's going to be different all the time and, and it's that opportunity to continue to learn through your career even though you've chosen kind of a specific career. Mm -hmm. Makes it pretty cool. So, yeah, uni was, uni was interesting. For the first year, it was very scary. But then you move down to the campus. It's a specific winemaking campus in Margot River. And the 10 of us did the, the next two years together. So. Tell, tell me about your first time in a cellar. Ooh. When I was studying, I worked for Lewin Estate. I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, just in the restaurant, because that was the experience I had. And at the time, 
that was the easiest thing to do in terms of make enough money to survive and live, but also I, don't, I could just leave my brain at work and, and focus on uni because that was, that was the goal. So the back of the house and the cellar was always there, but it wasn't really for restaurant staff to go back to necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, so my first harvest, I applied to be at Lewin and they said, no, we don't take first timers, even though I already worked there, but they were like, no, thank you. And then my boss got involved and she's, they're like, no, no, you need to take her. I told you, I've been very fortunate. <laughs> so I got in, thankfully, I got in there. Um, that was my first time in the cellar and I was terrified for a couple of reasons. Number one, because of, of the prestige of Lewin. I mean, they make arguably Australia's best Chardonnay. Um, you know, one, one bottle of Lewin Estate Chardonnay is upwards of $100. And as, as a beginner in the industry to be making that wine is pretty intense, I think. And I was, the, the way that Lewin works is they pair you up with someone that's a full-time person. Mm -hmm. So all of the people who are part-time or, or temporary all get paired up with a full-timer and we made the Chardonnay that year. That was our job. So it was pretty like pfft, crazy. But um, the other reason I was terrified is because I had broken my leg eight weeks before harvest and had surgery on it. So I had to get better to get into that cellar. And they weren't just, they didn't just want me walking, I had to be safely walking because mm -hmm. it's wet and it's mm -hmm. hoses and it's all the things. So that was pretty scary and a lot of pressure too. <laughs> what did you think of the work? I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, things, simple things, I had just, I guess if you, when you haven't worked with them before, they, you're just a bit clueless, right? Like hoses. Like when you turn on a hose and it's facing a certain direction, you might wet somebody. <laughs> Little things like that that I'm like, oh, you're such a dummy. But I just, I wet this one girl from UC Davis, which is, has a certain reputation. We won't talk about that here. <laughs> but she was so mad at me and it was just water. And the boss got really mad at her. And he's like, if you can't handle being wet, you're in the wrong job, my friend. So that was, little things like that, it was like, oh my gosh. It, was, it, was, it felt like a lot of pressure all the time and everyone's like, it'll get easier, it'll get easier. And it has gotten easier, but I loved it from the second I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have, being at Four Seasons, you're always immaculate. Like this hair would not be okay. Like the, <laughs> I'd have everything like slicked back and you know, perfect earrings and very, I was always in a suit you had to have, when I very first started with, with Four Seasons as a manager, you had to have no less than a two inch heel. Like it was all very, very regulated. And now I get real dirty and real wet and real disgusting. And my mum's like, I hey, this is different. She's like, you, this is not you. <laughs> and as time's gone on, she's like, this is much more you. I really like this you. So it's been a funny transition because, you know, I went from high heels to these, you know, um, in pretty quick succession, but it was it's an unexpected change, but a pleasant uh, side benefit mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you had mentioned that the reason for going back to school was to make wine. Like that, that was mm -hmm. your, your stated goal. So yep. as you started down the path, did you have an idea for where and where you wanted to be and what you wanted to do eventually? What was the eventual goal? Always wanted to be a winemaker, whether that meant making my own. It, no, it did mean making my own. Eventually I wanted to make my own wine. That's 100% sure. But I was pretty open about the path to get there. Um, from the very beginning though, my passions have always been Chardonnay and Pinot. So even though I was in Margaret River at the time, in Margs they make uh, Chardonnay and Cabernet because it's a maritime climate. Um, I was always going to go back east, which is home anyway, to do Pinot and Chard. Um, so my goal was always Victoria or the Yarra Valley. Um, not necessarily the Yarra, but always Victoria. I, I toyed with the idea of Tassie, because they also have fantastic Chardonnay and Pinot, but Tassie has such tiny, tiny producers that it's very hard to get a full-time job there. So to, you, you could do harvests, many harvests, mm -hmm. but you, you'd be struggling to find someone who needs a full-time seller hand, mm -hmm. and then to move up from there into assistant winemaker or winemaker is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I did that. Um, I finished my degree and, and always had the plan to go back east, but had um, a very small window where I could have done um, an international harvest. So that's how I ended up here. 
So tell me about that. So you, you got the, 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 you, after you graduated, mm. what was the first thing you did? Uh, I went to Bergstrom. So, I know, again, very fortunate. <laughs> yeah. Um, so as we were finishing up, one of our lecturers mentioned, like, if you want to do an international harvest, you know, these are the things you need to consider and, you know, basically gave us a list of stuff that we need to think about. And one of them was, what do you want to make and where do you want to be? Um, one of them was, how easy is it to get a visa? Do you speak the language? Like, all the little things that you need to know for travelling. And because I had such a short window, and Aussies have a pretty easy ride when it comes to visas in the US, I was like, I could easily squeeze in a US vintage. And I, I finished my degree in, in June. So it was, um, I had a kind of a, a quick window that I could come here, do a harvest, and then I was gonna start my real job in Victoria, hopefully by December. Mm -hmm. um, so what, I just- What I, year was this? This was 2000 and 15. Okay. 15? No, 15 at, at Lewin, 16 was my, my one year at Bergstrom. Okay. Yeah, so I finished in June of 16. And I just Googled the bejesus out of Oregon wine. I was like, Oregon's obviously where I want to be because it's Pinot and Chard. And I just, I, I Googled best Oregon Pinot, best Oregon Chardonnay, best Oregon cellar door, best Oregon winemaker, best Oregon, best Oregon, best Oregon, best Oregon, all of it. And I've started to whittle down like which are the ones that, that are appearing a lot, one after the other, and, but also then I started to look into those websites and be like, which of these companies has a similar ethos to me? So I, um, I applied to, after looking at a gazillion, I applied to about five, and Travis from Bergston reached out to me, and we had an interview, and by the end of the interview, he was like, when you come? He was already talking about when I got here. Um, 16 was an incredibly short vintage. Um, I think we did everything in five weeks at Bergstrom that year, uh, including like ferments and everything barreled down, done, done, done. I'm pretty sure it was, it was five or six weeks, it was insane. Um, and Josh really taught me, Josh and Caro, um, really taught me the beauty and the fun and the, just the appreciation for harvest. And the way that they celebrate the harvest is, is magical. So we had, number one, we had an incredible team that year and Josh and Carrie still talk about it. And I caught up with a bunch of them in Burgundy, actually, which was really fun. Um, but yeah, so we had an incredible team. I was actually the youngest on the team in terms of how many vintages I'd done. Not obviously age. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'd done, at that stage, I'd only done, it was my third harvest. And the next person up had already done five. And then it went up from there. So... Yeah, I was, I was a newbie, but everybody in that team was so generous with their time and their energy. And that's how I describe Caro and Josh too. They're very, very generous with their time and their knowledge and their energy. And, and it really just taught me what harvest is meant to be mm -hmm. and how it should be just a celebration. It should be fun. And the places that I've been in Australia weren't quite, they were just a bit more serious. Um, so then I got a, a bit of a feel for what I wanted my harvest to be. Um, whether I, you know, no matter where I did it, um, that's how I wanted it to be. So at the end of that trip, I was driving from here straight out to the coast and then down the coast road to San Diego. I have some friends in San Diego. Um, Cause we finished so quickly, I had time. So Josh said to me, I will set you up with a bunch of people all the way down. So Ken Palo was my very first stop at Walter Scott and the other girls from that harvest also joined me on that tasting and he, was equally as generous with his time and knowledge and spent three hours with three girls who were definitely not gonna buy any wine because we were all flying somewhere. And still we tasted out of a bunch of different barrels and talked about all the vineyards and we geeked out for so much time. And I knew straight away that I had to work with him. I loved the wines. Him and I, Erica says this often, she's like, you guys are the same person in two different bodies. It's crazy. So we have very similar ethos about how the cellar should look and how it should feel. And there were places that I've worked before um, in Australia in particular where it was like, oh, cleanliness, don't, it's not such a big deal. And I'm, I'm really big on hygiene 
and Ken is equally as weird about hygiene. So that worked out really well. So then I spent the next few months scheming as to how I was going to not have the other two girls be the one intern that Walter Scott had and how was it going to be me. <laughs> Thankfully they didn't want it anyway so it worked out alright. But I ended up, <laughs> um, I, I reached out to Josh actually and I was like hey I just wanted to see what you thought about me doing Harvest with Ken. And he wrote back within seconds, oh my gosh, perfect. You guys would be awesome together, let me call them. And I'm like, no, no, please, let me do it myself. But can I use you as a reference? I was like, you know, I'll, I'd, I would like to do the initial email. So I did that, it probably took me 24 hours to write what I thought was an amazing email. <laughs> um, and within 30 minutes of sending the email, Erica sent back and message, it was like, and it sounded like I had the job. So I texted Josh, I was like, Joshua Bergstrom, and three exclamation marks. He's like, I'm sorry, I had to tell them you'd be perfect. I was like, well, thank you, <laughs> but <laughs> it's not quite how I wanted it to work, but yeah. So then I, uh, I came and I worked with Walter Scott as the intern um, while Will Hamilton was still there making his wine, but very quickly growing out of the space. Um, so he moved out the following year and, and then we took on other interns and I was the Will, because Will had been there for the past five years. Yeah, um, so between Ken and, and Erica and I, we figured out how I could come back again and again and again. <laughs> and now I just don't leave. <laughs> so I did the back and forth for until 2020. So it was five vintages in total, or four vintages in total backwards and forwards and my full-time job in the Yarra Valley, uh, my boss there was a um, pretty special human and he said uh, that he would give me three months a year to come back and do the harvest here. Um, and then 2020 hit and things kind of changed for a lot of people I think. Um, and the winery that I was working at decided that they wanted to get bigger. Mm -hmm. And for me it was already too big. It was, a, it was about a medium-sized winery at the time. And I'd gone just through the ranks and ended up as winemaker. Um, but winemaker in that setting is someone who writes job sheets and spends a lot of time on the computer. And yes, you do a lot of science, which is great, but you don't actually make any wine anymore. And I wanted to be a winemaker. <laughs> so I had the title, but I didn't do the job anymore. Um, and I was talking to Jess about it. We used to go to, we always do a, a harvest trip, just the team, where we go out somewhere and we used to go to mine them. So we were sitting at the river, there were probably some wines involved. And I was just talking about it and she's like, just come here, it'll be great. You know, just come here and just be here all the time. And then she told Ken and Erica that that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and they said, are you, you know, are you serious? What do you, what do you think about it? And I was like, well, it'd be great, but you guys, it's such a tiny business, it's, it's not really doable. And they talked about it and said, we could handle, we could, we could pay you for six months. We'll, we'll pay you every month, so it's like a half salary every month. Mm -hmm. If you can make that work, we would love to have you. And I was like, I can make that work. So I went home to Australia, quit my job straight away, but I said I would do harvest. So I got home in December told my boss that I was leaving, but I said I would do the final harvest because you can't mm -hmm. leave someone in the lurch, especially not at that time of year. So I went through to April and hello COVID. So um, Ken and Erica had a big discussion with them about the fact that Walter Scott might not, not even be alive after COVID. They weren't sure what was gonna happen with sales. Literally everything stopped. Mm -hmm. um, that conversation was in March I was still doing harvest, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, but I didn't say anything to the boss. And then the world kind of shut down. We weren't really sure what was happening. So I was like, can, can you give me a couple of months? And no, no one else at work knew, only the boss. And he's like, yeah, for sure. Let's, let's just ride through the next couple of months and see what happens, which I did. And then Ken and Erica are like, actually, things are going really well. Can you get back here? And I was like, Australians aren't allowed to leave, but let me try. So, um, there was this special request thing that you had to do to the government to be able to leave the country. So I applied to leave the country. I was like, I've been doing this the last four years. Um, and I kind of spun it that, you know, my salary relied on it. And if I didn't do it, I'd probably have to go on the dole, which is like government money. 
So I, I don't know if that helped or not, but I was like, oh, I'm going to be relying on you for my money or you could just let me go. <laughs> so they let me go. But they told me 10 days before my flight, like before I was supposed to be here. So I had no idea. In the end, I quit the job anyway because I was like, I need to find something smaller that I'm more passionate about and I'm excited about. Then the government got back to me and like, you're allowed to go. So then I had to do a mad scramble to get flights and do all the things to get here by the 1st of August, 2020. Um, so I was doing six months kind of spread out. So four months for harvest and two months for blending and bottling in May and June. And the rest of the time I was spending back in Costa Rica because I love it. Um, and I, know I still work in Costa Rica actually. I have a job down there where I, work, I help out a mate. He owns three restaurants and I do all the event planning. But I can do it remotely, so that works out really well. Yeah. That's but, um, a wild and crazy story. <laughs> I spend about nine months of the year here now. I'm yeah. curious about the, as you were bouncing back and forth there, tell mm -hmm. me about the, diff the similarities and differences making wine in Australia, making wine in Oregon. What, what, what do the industries have in common and what is different about them? Weather is actually pretty similar. It's a little hotter at home, um, but the nights are colder in the area where I'm from. So our diurnal shift is huge. So you end up with a very similar chemistry in the grapes and, and a very similar product that you're working with. Um, also on the weather is one of the biggest differences and the reason that I ended up here. It's really, really tough in Australia, particularly in the Yarra Valley, to um, go organic or biodynamic. We have some pretty big mildew issues and they're very hard to control organically. Whereas here, even though you've got the mildew issues, you can, they're controllable mm -hmm. with organics and biodynamics. And that is kind of what brought me here. The product is definitely better here, 100%. Um, particularly in the old, I'm obviously biased, but particularly in the old Amid Hills. <laughs> um, yeah, there's just a finesse to the grapes up there, but they've got a, a power and a structure to them as well. That's so much fun to work with. Mm. So yeah. Um, Obviously, same grape varieties. The industry in the Yarra is pretty similar to Oregon in that it's a lot of small businesses. Um, the place where I was, medium size, but it was the number three in terms of size. So there were two big guns, um, Chandon's there. They've got a massive sparkling facility. Um, and then there's one other, and I can't even think who it is now, but one of the, you know, someone like Constellation owns it. Mm -hmm. And then there was the place I worked for, and we were not that big. So in the, I think our biggest year we did about 1,800 tonnes, but our normal kind of size was somewhere in the 1,000 to 1,200 tonnes. I don't know how many cases that translates to. Um, now I talk in cases, but back then we talked in, Australia normally talks in how much, how much tonnage you do. Yeah, so I mean, I had a team of, there were two winemakers and then we had a team of about four supervisors or cellar masters, whatever you want to call them, underneath that and then a team through harvest of about 14. So a decent size. Here we have just the four of us. <laughs> That's a pretty big difference. Um, but that, there are a lot of similarities which is what brought me here in the first place. I honestly didn't think I'd stay mm -hmm. um, since I've been away with four seasons for so long. I promised my mum I'd go home but sorry mum. <laughs> Still, still not quite there. <laughs> yeah. So, you, uh, tell me about the experience at Walter Scott. Uh, you obviously you, you had you, you were there and you left and you came back mm. and now you're now you're here. So, tell me about as you've been there a few years now. Uh, how has your role grown and how has have you seen the company grow? Ooh. So I guess I guess I kind of started as the intern. It was never called that word, but that's I mean that's definitely what I was. Um, and once Will left which was only the next year, I kind of became Ken's, I say left hand because I'm left handed, left hand man straight away. Um, and especially once we figured out that I was going to be able to come back on a consistent basis. He, he trusted me, which is, he's not that great at, and he, I'm okay with saying that. <laughs> he's not good with trust. Um, but yeah, he, he trusts me and, and the fact that we do have that very similar mindset about how the seller should feel and, and how wine should be made. And he went to Burgundy in 17 and came back two days before we started picking. And he learned a lot in Burgundy about how we want to make Chardonnay. And that's re really where I saw our Chardonnay program change and grow um, in size and in percentage um, in terms of what we do. So last year we did 60% uh, Chard. 
which is pretty cool uh, and not normal for, for the Willamette. And that's something we're really proud of. We're excited about Chardonnay and we, I mean, we're super passionate about, about that grape variety. We love Pinot too and we love making Pinot because ferment management is so wonderful. And you, you have a real synergy with the grapes when, when it's red. But once you start to learn ferment management with Chardonnay, and I mean, we allow it to start in tank and then push everything as a fermenting juice into barrel, which is a little different. Um, but it means all the barrels are kind of in the same spot for each batch of wine, and we check we check them every day at Walter Scott, which I think is also something that not a lot of people do. So we're checking temperatures and and sugar levels every single day in our Chardonnay ferments. And once you start that barrel work, there's also an intimacy with Chardonnay that a lot of people don't feel because they don't do it, they don't do the work. Um, so we've we've grown in that sense that we're very very focused in our Chardonnay work. I remember a deep roots. Um, tasting that we went to. It was probably my second year here. 18, it was probably 18. And we were just talking to people and we were kind of at the end of harvest, but we still had some ferments going and 100% we were still checking Chardonnay every day. And we were talking to people, you know, about how things were going and they're like, oh, Chardonnay, we haven't even looked at it. And I said again, since when? Like, and he, and he said, probably since they put it in the barrel. And then the next year we went to an, a winery, as you do, um, mm -hmm you know, post harvest and um, again, we were looking at their Chardonnay in their barrels. They couldn't reach the wine with the thief that they were using. And they knew that we were really into Chardonnay and were very, I think, I hope, very embarrassed by that scenario. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, the thief was a decent length and you couldn't reach the juice. So little things like that made me start to go, oh, we're actually doing something pretty special here. And then Ken's, refocus from what was going on in the winery to what was happening in the vineyard is what really changed it. And that started in 18 after his trip in 17. And it's just been more refined and more refined over the years. It's hard to get the growers on board because we buy all our fruit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's something that it is the key to making great Chardonnay is what happens in the vineyard. And to get the acid levels that we want, you have to drop yield and you have to drop it early. So, yeah, that's probably been the biggest evolution, I think, for Walter Scott. And then the other thing is in 2021, so last year, sat down as a team, Ken, Erica, Jess and I, and we made the decision not to take on an intern, a fifth person, for a couple of reasons. It was just always weird. The four of us have been together now for this to be our sixth vintage together. And so to bring on another person was, it really was a fifth wheel. And that poor person, we're really, really close. We're a very tight team. We know each other's strengths and weaknesses very, very well. And to have someone come into that, it was just always a bit strange because we are so tight. And the other thing is we were spending so much time with that fifth person, making sure they were okay, double checking that they were doing what we wanted and kind of babysitting. We're like, maybe we should just spend that time focused on the wine. So we gave it a go and we loved it. <laughs> it, it feels so bad to say that. But we loved it, and so we're going to—we're never taking on another intern. Mm. We'll have people for a few days who want to do some experience, or you know, sommeliers that love working with our wine that want to come in and do a day or two. Who, that no problem. But we'll never ever have another two-month intern. Mm. So they're probably the two biggest things that have grown. Yeah. Tell me about your label. You mm. obviously mentioned that was something that was a goal from the beginning was yes. to be a winemaker, to have your own product. So tell me about the evolution and the creation of that. Okay. Um, in 2019, I had the opportunity with my Australian company to um, just do a two-ton ferment, which was exactly what I wanted to do, no more, which is four barrels. It was exactly what I wanted. And the winemaker at the time, I was the assistant winemaker at the time, and the winemaker came to me and said, you can choose between these three vineyards and he'd chosen the top three for me. And I picked one that I, it, it wasn't what everybody thought I was gonna pick, but the reason I chose the one I did is because I felt like the mix of clones up there was cooler, like it was really different. Um, in Australia, it's probably similar to here, there's a lot of 115, which is so boring, if that's all you've got. I mean, you can do stuff with it, but you need diversity. Um, and the vineyard that I chose had diversity and the other thing about it was it had a higher elevation. 
And he looked at me at the time and he said, that's the one I would have chosen. And just that was it, let it go. So I made a 2019 Yarra Valley Pinot. Really, for, for the Yarra Valley that year, it was really cold. Um, it was a very late vintage, but the skins were pretty thick and the berries were really tiny. So it was easy to get colour, but it was also really easy to over extract. Um, but the wines ended up really delicate because it, you couldn't really punch them down because you would end up with burnt tea, more or less. Um, yeah, so the wine from there is it's a very Yarra Valley. Like if I put my two wines together, the Yarra Valley and the Sojo from the same vintage with the same single person, one two ton ferment, four barrels, everything was so, so similar. They are polar opposites of the earth. And it's funny because they actually are <laughs> polar opposites of the earth. So it's, they are both really indicative of place, which was always my goal. I'm like, I just want, I want to not stuff up what's been done in the vineyard. Um, that was always kind of my ideal, I guess, was to have beautiful fruit to work with and then just make sure I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> yeah, so that was my first vintage. And then I, after Jess's drunken discussion in, <laughs> in the middle of Oregon at a river, um, word travels fast in this industry and especially in the old Amity Hills. So Denny from Sojo had somehow heard through the grapevine, um, no pun intended, <laughs> that I was considering moving the brand here. Because that was my first question, is like, how can I be here when I have a brand in Australia? And Jess, being Jess, was like, just move it here, it's gonna be great. <laughs> so Denny had heard this story and was like, I'm gonna give you two tons of sojo. Not give me, obviously I paid for it, but you should take two tons of sojo and make sojo. And who can pass up that? opportunity, nobody. So even though I was going home again, I did it. Um, so I have a 2019 vintage from both hemispheres, which is super cool. And it was my first vintage ever. <laughs> and I have, yeah. Um, so it was, a, it was a whirlwind journey, because it kind of, the, the Australian one was very organized and very well planned. The US one was not so. It was like, you are getting fruit, and it's coming in three days time. So it was fun. Um, and 19 here was another pretty cool sort of wettish year. We were picking in between the rain. Um, but again, small berries, thick skin, so over extraction, definitely a possibility. But the power of the fruit here is very, very different. Um, so along with not stuffing up what had happened in the vineyard, I always wanted to make a wine that was balanced. Mm -hmm. Gymnastics, food and beverage. My whole life has been really all about balance. And I think that as a person, I've always tried to be that too. Um, so filigree and stone, the name came around with that in mind because I wanted the filigree. Do you know what filigree is? Okay, um, let's start there. <laughs> um, it's, it's, have you ever seen Indian jewelry? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's metalwork, it's always metalwork, but it's a lacy pattern within the metalwork. So it's very, very fine. It's really in intricate, it's complex. Um, that's filigree. So that I wanted that element of complexity, but elegance and prettiness and and that. But I also wanted the structure and the power and the depth of stone, and the difference between like filigree is kind of like ethereal and stone's very grounded. So that's what I want to always try to show and and have in my wines. Um, and it's interesting because I, I do get those kinds of comments without talking about how I got to the brand name. I get those kinds of comments already. So I'm like, I'm, I think I'm heading in the right direction. <laughs> so that feels really good. Um, yeah. So that's how my own little brand came about. Um, didn't make any wine in 2020 for obvious reasons. Um, but 2021, I made a Sojo again. I will always make a Sojo. Uh, but my goal is to make uh, four barrels of, of Sojo, but then four barrels of Chard. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the lookout for a really iconic Chardonnay vineyard. Um, and I'm hoping, we'll see, um, to get some fruit from Freedom Hill. Because I think it's, it's, it's a fantastic vineyard, but specifically for Chardonnay, it's an epic vineyard. Um, so we'll see. I was walking the vineyard for Walter Scott with Dustin not long ago, right before Burgundy. And he had mentioned that some fruit this year was being sold to another winemaker, and it's a girl. And he's like, yeah, I think she makes good enough white wine to sell some fruit to. And I'm like, but what about me? When are you going to sell fruit to me? He goes, when you ask. And I was like, oh. 
I should have just asked. But I didn't think this was the year because he got hit pretty hard with frost. Mm -hmm. So next year I'll ask. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah. You talked about balance and obviously a, mm -hmm. a, a recurring theme. Yeah. Tell me about f being, for the first time being with your own brand, having full control and not anybody else to sort of answer to. How do you, how did you decide what sort of what balance meant to you in that right. case and what you wanted to produce? Terrifying, first of all, obviously, because you don't see the results of what you do for so long. So it's, it's definitely trial and error. I had the very good fortune of having worked with Sojo for four years before I made my own Sojo. So that helped me a lot. I, I knew how the ferment behaved. I knew what oak played nice with it. I, I already had some ideas in my head, so I knew that I wanted to have Terenso in the mix in terms of my oak program. Um, and then I had access to some neutral barrels. So I had a once fill Terenso and a twice fill, I think it was Bertoigny, and then a bunch of new, uh, neutral, very neutral. Um, and I already knew that would work. Um, I have seen in, in pretty much everywhere I work that um, pump overs is, is a really nice way to start a ferment and there's no need to really do anything until the end and, until you know how much structure is already there and then you build in the structure in the last three to five days. Mm -hmm. um, so that I already had a really good idea of 19 I only needed um, one punch down and one Romo Pitage because that was just the vintage that it was and Australia I did exactly the same actually. Um, yeah, which is very strange, and then two completely different wines. But um, yeah, I think just knowing knowing the fruit pretty well before I started, which again, so so fortunate. Not everybody gets to play with the fruit that they're going to eventually have as their own. Um, and obviously, I'll continue to change things a little bit. Um, yeah, so we'll see. I've got a new barrel coming into the mix. I bought my first new barrel last year, and then I've got a new brand. I'm going to use a Fran Francois Frere this year because I know that it plays quite nicely, but I want to make sure that the Terenso Francois Frere Sojo mix is kind of nice. So there, there will always be a little bit of trial and error. Um, and the, the balance comes into it in that I, I don't want anything to stick out. Mm -hmm. I want it to be structured, but I don't want it, I don't want people to go, oh, that's big, or that's masculine, or that's you know, rich or whatever. I, w I want it to be there, but I want it to be balanced by this lightness and this ethereal kind of quality. And, you know, I want it to be fruity, but I don't want people to go, oh, that's fruity, because that's not a good, that's not a compliment. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Like, I, that's where the balance comes in for me, is trying to, is literally trying to balance that, the structure of Eola Amity mm -hmm. with the clones that I have. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky at Sojo I have um, a majority of pomade which is a really beautiful kind of, it, it can give you that ethereal quality if you let it, but you have to be careful because it can also give you tea <laughs> if you work it too hard. Yeah, so the Sojo fruit, I've got about 70% pomade and then a little bit of Badensville, a little bit of 115. So, does so that answer the question? Absolutely. Okay. You mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Chardonnay as kind of the next step for you, making, mm. you making your own. Obviously, working at a place that's becoming pretty synonymous with Chardonnay. Yes. What do you want to do differently? Um, I don't think mine will be as reduced as ours at Walter Scott. I love the reduction, um, but I think that that's, that's Ken's real, that's his trademark. Um, and I've, I've faced this a lot too with selling my wine. It's like, what's different? Mm -hmm. how, how does yours differ? And so I will never use, Ken is a, or Walter Scott is a, um, a huge proponent of Chassan barrels. So I'll never use Chassan, not even used, because it's, I can taste it. When I taste a Walter Scott, the first thing I get is that barrel, because I know it so well. So that's my first kind of thing. And somehow, I don't know how it works, and I don't know why it works, but it does my wines are just more feminine than the Walter Scott's. And it it's, makes no sense because I make the Walter Scott wine too. I have as much energy input into those wines, but for some reason, they're just more feminine. Mm. Um, so I think my Chardonnay would be the same. What I love about Freedom specifically is it has that floral aspect. I don't know if you know Freedom, the vineyard very mm. well, um, but there's this combination of lemon and blossoms that I love. And I would definitely try to accentuate that um, and bring out that sort of feminine side of it. So I would do, I mean, we've just spent a month, or not a month, we've just spent two weeks in Burgundy and 
it was interesting because there were a lot of things we're always learning. That's the beautiful thing about this job and this career and this lifestyle is that you do get to learn all the time. But at the same time, we, we kind of had some affirmations too. And we're like, hmm, we do that pretty well. Um, so that was nice too. And to see that some of the things that we do really work, obviously I'm going to do those same things. You know, Lee's, the Lee's program that we have at Walter Scott is unlike anything I've ever seen in, in Australia or here. I mean, when we've got, you know, the teams coming through after harvest and we're racking and we taste our leaves, people are like, what are you doing? It's like, well, you can't put it in unless you know it's delicious. So little things like that, that we do, that I think make a big difference, I'll obviously do the same things. But to make it different, um, obviously the Oak program will be a huge part of it. Um, and I'll, yeah, try to tone down the reduction a little bit. We'll see, see how it works. What about selling your, your wine? You mentioned mm. that, that you, get, you get questions about that. Uh, you finally have a product that is yours again. Mm. Uh, how have you gone about selling it and what is it like putting it out there? It's, it's still strange to me that people want to pay me money for something that I made. Um, I, get, I get a little bit giddy and like, <laughs> I can't believe they did that. Um, so that's kind of fun and still terrifying because I want them to like it, obviously when they open it. Um, I've been really fortunate because Jess does all the sales for Walter Scott, so she's just dragged me along with her, um, which has been wonderful. Um, I would probably sell the wine a little bit different to the way Jess sells it, which is interesting, but now that I've met everybody, I can, I can start to break away from her a little bit and, and start to sell on my own and tell my own story the way I would tell it. Um, but it's been fun. It's been fun to hear her sell it because she's a way better salesman than I am. I'm, I'm the craftsman. I'm definitely not the salesperson. <laughs> um, but it's been fun for sure. Uh, and it's been interesting to hear her sell it because she's, number one, she's really good at it. But number two, she does have a different aspect to the story and a different side to the story. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess that is right. So that's been really interesting. Um, like I, I met someone just today before I was here. And he's like, who are you? Like what? And I'm like, oh yeah, I've, I'm, I work at Walter Scott. And, and and this happens all the time. They're like, oh, so, you know, are you just here for the harvest? I'm like, no, this is my sixth vintage. And they're like, how have you flown under the radar for so long? And I'm like, because I try. <laughs> you know, I always let the three of them do it because I was always back and forward. Um, and I still prefer if the three of them do it. I'm happy being the assistant winemaker. Um, just put me in the cellar and put me to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm kind of the same with sales. I need to, it's hard. That shyness is still a part of my personality, even after all this time. So yeah, the sales aspect is tricky, but with the places I've got it into, I've been really lucky mm -hmm. because of Jess. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I also have some Four Seasons connections still. So the wine is randomly in San Diego. Um, I have a friend down there who is uh, the head chef of a, a company called CH Projects and they have about 20 something restaurants at this point. Um, and this is another funny story. He, I said to him, can I ask a favor? Can you put me in touch with your wine guy? And he's like, yeah, no worries. I'm like, no other favors. Like, I don't want you to put it on the list. If he doesn't like it, it's okay. It's fine. Anyway, I get down there and he hadn't, the guy hadn't tried the wine yet. I'd sent him a, tr a sample bottle, expecting him to try it and then order the wine. And, but he ordered two cases of wine without trying the wine. And I was like, oh man. And I was like, Jason, <laughs> I told you not to do that. And so we went down, he's like, no, I really wanted to try it with you. So we tried it together and he's like, oh, this is actually good. And I was like, so then I knew for sure that my friend had said, you need to put this on the list. Thankfully, he's ordered more cases since then. But yeah, I've, I've had some opportunities based on my Four Seasons connections. So I have another friend in Miami, not with Four Seasons anymore, um, but who is the GM of a hotel and same thing. He's like, I'll get my girl to reach out to you. So it's in some random places throughout the country, but mostly it's here in Oregon. Yeah. You talked earlier about uh, obviously getting here just in time for the 2020 harvest, which was then, of course, its own adventure. So I'm mm. curious about your sort of recollections of that harvest. You mentioned you didn't make any wine personally for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about what 2020 harvest was like, and what were the sort of what what were the takeaways for you from that? Oh, the takeaways are uh, education is amazing <laughs> because I did my thesis on smoke taint at university, and our head lecturer 
at, at Curtin University at that time. So the, the wine program guy was also the leading authority on smoke taint in Australia. So he made our thesis on that because he knew we couldn't cheat. Mm -hmm. So you had to research the bejesus out of smoke taint because it was really hard to get any papers. You know, you're looking for peer-reviewed papers without his name on them. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a really, it was a tough assignment, but it was lifesaver to be honest. So 2020, being Aussie, I'm very used to fires. Um, we have bushfires almost every year. The town that where I have a house now, I wasn't involved in this fire, but was part of the Black Saturday fire. So in 2009, in this town, the entire town was razed to the ground, like completely flat with the exception of three structures. A child's cubby house, the bakery, and a log cabin, which makes absolutely no sense, but that's what happened. Um, so fire is just something, as an Aussie, you just get used to it. And you get used to what to do and how to prepare, I guess. Not necessarily, not, I'm not even talking about wine making right now. Mm -hmm. But in 2020, um, I, I packed a bag to go because there were people, they were talking about evacuations pretty close to us. And I'm like, I just need to be ready. So I packed a bag and I told the guys at Walter Scott and they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, oh, this is what you do. Like when they tell you you need to be ready, you go. Like you have to be ready, ready. Like put your passports in there, get all your whatever, expensive jewelry, anything you want to keep, letter from your mum before she died, whatever, like put it in that bag. You need to be ready to go. So the whole team did that in the end. And as it was getting closer and closer, I don't know if you know Andy Steinman. So Sue and Andy are um, small partners in Walter Scott. They own 20%. They don't have any say in what goes on. They're pretty much silent partners, but they're very enthusiastic and, and super helpful. Like Andy comes to sort fruit every year and he's a huge um, kind of guide, I guess, on the financial side of things. Very, very smart, savvy businessman. And he does a lot of, um, I guess, purchases is what he, like he does a lot of consulting on purchasing wine businesses. Mm. Um, so he was worried about the financial aspect of what happens if we make a wine that turns bad in bottle because he tried something from California, I want to say 2017 or 18, they had some bad fires and he is friends with someone who has a winery down there and theirs went bad in bottle. Hmm. Um, so I was already talking about mini ferments, he was already talking about cash. And they were like, wait, what's a mini ferment? How does this work? So we went, I went and collected fruit from every vineyard, did the mini ferments. Um, everything looked great up until the final day. And on that day, we had Freedom Hill Pinot on deck, delivered. Um, and we tasted through every wine. And Andy was there with us, because obviously it's a huge financial decision to not make wine. But every single one of those ferments tasted like an ashtray. So we cried a lot. Um, and Ken and Erica made the decision not to make any red. We changed our Chardonnay program completely. So our normal press cycle is about three hours. We're a pretty like long, slow, gentle type crushing situation. We changed it, it was 54 minutes, our press cycle. Ken decided to crush anything, which was against what everybody had said. Um, but the first press load we did, we had about 80% of our juice straight through the press without even starting the button. And we're like, surely the quicker you get it off the skins, the better. And I called home. So we have a, an amazing uh, wine research in institute in South Australia, the AWRI. And I called them and I'm like, hey, I'm in Oregon. The first thing they said was, are you okay? Which is amazing. And I said, I, I, I'm all over the reds, but I know nothing because there was no research on whites mm -hmm. when I did my thesis. I'm like, I don't know anything about whites. Is there anything new? Have you got any new research? Have you got anything you can send me? He said, there is nothing concrete on white. He said, we're definitely still in the research phase of what's happening. Um, but these are the things I can tell you. Duh, 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 duh. And I was like, we've decided to crush everything and just get it off its skins. He's like, the faster you get anything off its skins, the better. I was like, okay, great. So they were really the only people that said, yes, keep going with what you're doing. We tasted all the smoky ferments. We made the decision not to make wine, but we had red sitting on deck that was destined for red wine. So it was picked at red wine mm -hmm. sugars. Um, so we had to figure out how to make that delicious rosé, but we just put it through the press like a white and made a rosé out of it. Much to Ken's chagrin, he said, I will never make rosé. And then here we are, pressing rosé. Um, 
So super emotional vintage, it was hard for sure, but we're looking at everybody now trying to sell their 2020 wines and some of them are going bad in bottle and some of them are trying to convince their customers that they don't have smoky wine and there's just a lot of stuff going on and we're so happy we made the hard decision then mm -hmm. because we've dealt with it. It's gone, all our rosé sold from 2020, all our Chardonnay sold from 2020. We called it Bois Moi, which means some things which we didn't realise quite rude in French but if you look at it word for word it means drink me because we wanted to encourage people like we know you would normally lay things down from Walter Scott don't do it just drink it while it's good just mm -hmm. drink it mm -hmm. so that's what happened and yeah now when we look at things we're really glad that we did it mm -hmm. and and we came back to the to the concept and and it wasn't just about money um, but it was more about we respect our customers and we respect their palates and we respect their intelligence and you can't go out with a wine that's subpar and expect them to pay Walter Scott prices when it's not a Walter Scott wine. So we bulked out a bunch of the white. Um, we were able to make 90 cases of Freedom Hill Shard. That was the only single vineyard we made and then we made two epic blends that had all the great stuff in it. Um, yeah, and just sold it out as quickly as we could and said, drink it as quickly as you can. So, yeah, tough, but we're glad we made those hard decisions back then. And Ken and Erica made the decision to pay the growers half the growing fees for the year. So even though we didn't take the fruit, they paid half the growing costs for the season's wine. And then Andy, because he has so many contacts, helped to find people who wanted to buy the fruit that we were letting go. So 2021, we were, we were nervous for sure as to whether we were going to get our blocks back and were we going to get the same fruit. Um, but because of the way we handled the relationships, we got every single one of our growers mm -hmm. back and all of the same blocks that we had originally had. Mm -hmm. So it says a lot about Ken and Erica as people. Um, I think about us as a team too. We sat down and, and we thought about it really hard, mm -hmm. really hard. You don't make decisions like that lightly. Um, and Andy came at it, at it, like I said, from the financial point of view. I came at it from the scientific point of view because I knew. And they're like, well, everybody's trying these finding agents. Everybody's trying this and trying that. I'm like, there is nothing. There is nothing you can do. That wine will not taste good. And that's always our goal is to make delicious wine. So if it's not going to taste good, what's the point? Yeah. So, yeah, tough year, but we learned a lot. I think we learned a lot about each other too. I mean, and our growers. There's a lot of relationship building in a, in a time like that. So, so tell me about the, uh, we talked about kind of the, your sort of initial thoughts on the Oregon wine industry. Tell me about how you've seen the industry grow, evolve, change mm. since you've been a part of it. Uh, obviously, including the pandemic and including the mm. fires of 2020 and everything else. What, and what does the industry look like to you now? Um, it's... The one thing that I find really interesting and, and a little confronting is the distance, I'm going to call it, between the people who work our farms and everybody else. We don't have that kind of racism in Australia. We have racism, 100%, but not where it's in your face and so obvious, to the point where we had someone come to the winery and ask who picks your grapes and when that person was told that it's all Mexicans, he walked out. I'd never seen anything like that before. So that I think is really interesting and I think that it's something that people are very focused on with the new salary kind of connections and making sure that salary is the same. It was, you know, I think that salary survey was originally to check that women were getting the same pay. I'm not 100% on that, but I thought that was what it was for. And then it got, you know, it went and they looked at everything, winemakers and salespeople and cellar door people and all the things. And then when it got to vineyard people, it was the only time where the men were paid less than the women. And I was like, well, why? Like, I didn't even get it. And Erica's like, Kathy, they're the Mexicans. And I was like, oh. And it, it kind of, it broke my heart a little bit that that is so obvious. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are definitely people in this industry who are working to fix that. I think there's a long way to go. The same as the racism in Australia, I think there's a long way to go, but I think there are people who are now focused on it, and I don't think that there was a focus on it before. So that's really cool. That's really nice to see. Um, and I, I would, the direction that I'd like to see it go is that we stop paying people by the bucket. 
because I think it's a really demeaning process. To see somebody with a tag on their back and every time they dump a bucket of fruit in, they get a, a hole punched in their tag. So that at the end of the day, that's how much they get paid. That's, I'm sorry, but that's bollocks. That is not okay. These people are humans. So that's a side of the industry that's very confronting to me and, mm -hmm. it, and it upsets me. Mm -hmm. And I hope that we're moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of evolution of the business, I think that Oregon was so heavily focused on Pinot that they kind of lost sight about what was possible here. Um, Pinot Gris was in there just because you kind of had to have a white wine and it was the money maker and even the Pinot Gris wasn't good and it can be if you try hard but no one was trying um, but Chardonnay can be even better than Pinot Gris especially when you try but still there's a lot I'd say there are five percent of winemakers in Oregon that are actually making intentional good Chardonnay that's changed it's more than when I first got here for sure um, and there are people that think that they're making good intentional Chardonnay, but they're still doing it with that like, oh, the Chardonnay will make itself mm -hmm. in the barrel attitude, which is not how you make grey Chardonnay. You have to be, like it needs almost more attention than the Pinot, which people haven't quite figured out yet. But we're getting there. That's definitely changed. The other thing I think that's changed is the, the grape variety situation. Mm -hmm. um, climate change is affecting everywhere in the world. And in Australia, I think we probably saw it or feel it more than other places. I don't know why. Maybe the hole in the ozone layer, I'm not sure. Um, but climate change affects our little island, our big island, <laughs> really heavily. So we went towards the Mediterranean varieties very, very quickly in Australia. And I can see that change happening here now. Like you look at Tom from Pray Tell. He's all into cool stuff. He's like, I just want to try that and I want to try that. And, and he'll just give it a go. He's like, oh, just let's see if it works. And I love that about him. It's definitely not the wine I want to make, but the fact that Oregon is going in, in those directions and spreading it out, I think is really cool. Um, and I love drinking Tom's wine. So, you know, it's, yeah, it's super fun. I'm unfortunately this classic, like driven Pinot and Chardonnay freak. But <laughs> yeah, it's, I think that's a really good thing. Um, I think that again, back on the farming side, we need to be, I don't even know how you control this or how you fix it, but there are so many people coming in and, and planting more fruit. We have a massive oversupply of grapes. We don't even have the people to pick what we have now, let alone continue to grow the business. Where are we? There's gonna be a serious labor discussion happening very soon. Um, Dustin from Freedom has purchased a machine harvester. It's a very, very good one, it was a great, decision the machine that he bought is is top of the range and it doesn't destroy the fruit and the vines like the old ones that i have seen in australia because mm. um, machine picked fruit is very common in australia you would do hand picked in australia for your top level but all the other is machine and it's for the same reason labor is really it's hard to come by it's expensive and especially through covid we didn't allow anyone into the country and all of our harvest is done by migrants everybody's backpacking around australia and, and you get to stay a second year if you spend a season picking australia's smart right like we have a tiny for the size of our country where we're land mass wise we're very similar to the us you guys have 300 and something million people we have 28 so we ne we need people to come in so the way that the australian government worked is you can come for 12 months and you can work I think you can work for six of those months on, on a regular like backpacking visa. But if you do a harvest anywhere, oranges, grapes, wheat, anything, you can do an extra 12 months travel. So all of our harvest workers are from somewhere else. They're not Australian. Um, yeah, so that we're kind of used to, but we're also used to the fact that you have to machine harvest because there's, there's just not enough people to do the hand picking. So I think that will, that's going to happen here. We saw machine harvesters in Burgundy in Premier Cru vineyards. I mean, it makes you want to cry for the amount that we pay, especially in the US and Australia, for those bottles. You're like, no way. <laughs> it makes you really sad, but it's, it's an unfortunate kind of consequence of the direction that everything's heading. Mm -hmm. So that, I don't know how to stop people planting more grapes. I mean, they're all these rich people want to come in and they think that that's the way to go. They don't realise that if you take over a vineyard, that's a much more sustainable 
situation. But I guess they're the changes that, that are, I see that are kind of relevant or happening or need to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about as you look ahead, then what, what comes next for the Oregon wine industry? Um, I, I think the, the focus needs to be back in the vineyards. Both staffing and planting and the way that people farm. I think here um, there's a lot more organic, there are a lot more organic growers than what you see elsewhere. I mean, when you go to California, the ground is like this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's spotless because it has to be photo perfect. And people don't realise, but when you start to talk about life in a vineyard and what it feels like and the energy, and if you don't have grass and stuff, then there's nothing underneath either. The, you know, and talking about monocultures, and it was interesting when we went to Burgundy, there are no bugs. And I didn't realise, I mean, I studied burgundy like crazy I could tell you rote learned all kinds of things about it but when you see it and you see the sheer size of what's going on there and it is a monoculture for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers and hundreds of kilometers it's a monoculture and there are no bugs and you get back here and there are bugs everywhere and it's like ah, so annoying but then you're like oh. I had this light bulb moment two days ago and I was like there are so many bugs it's so annoying and I'm like no it's actually beautiful we need them so little things like that, I think we do really well here, but at the same time, people are still very stuck in their ways about conventional farming. So I think there's still a ways to go with, mm -hmm. with becoming more aware of the planet and how we can do, even though we, we make grapes and wine, yes, it's a monoculture, but there are ways to not have it be that way in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. I had a friend once who's, and he's very concerned about the environment and the planet and gets pretty down about it. But he's a wine guy, and I was like, "So how do you, how would you like to see this industry?" And he said, "I want, I don't want to be able to see vineyards. I want it to all just look like a forest." And I was like, "Wow, that's actually pretty cool and very true." And when you talk to people like Kevin Chambers from Cusa Farm, and he was making his own teas to spray on the vineyard and and things like that, and he's like, "It, it, you need biology to kill biology." and fix biology. You can't have chemistry fix biology. It's not how things work. And we had some, some growers this year who were very, very nervous about the mildew pressure. I mean, it, it's highest it's been in 20 years, I think, this year. And it was pretty scary. And a lot of them, who are organic growers, wanted to put some kind of systemic spray on. But I think that where the, the lull or the, the lack of of knowledge is here is that vines are very much like people in that when you take them in an organic direction they build up an immunity system and their the systemic sprays won't work anymore because they have their own immunity and so they're gonna even if they get the mildew they'll fight it better than if you put a systemic spray on it mm -hmm. so I think that's where it needs to go I don't know how quickly we're going to get there but that's the direction things need to go there needs to be a focus on the vineyards and how we can Yes, grow this beautiful fruit, but in a much more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have a choice. You, you, I mean, we have to be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. So. What about the future for yourself, both for your, your work at Walter Scott, <laughs> your, your own brand, and, yeah. and your sort of life in general? What are you looking ahead to? What are you planning for? Um, I'm not a good planner, which is why my handle is Tipsy Gypsy on Instagram. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll always, I think, have that kind of wanderlust. But I never want to make, my, my goal with, with filigree and stone is, I never want to make so much wine that I can't work at Walter Scott. I love that team. I love the wine we make. I'm super proud of it. And I don't want to ever not make that wine. So my, my filigree and stone project will always be four barrels of Chardonnay and four barrels of Pinot. It's, it's sustainable. Hopefully it'll kind of become a wine that, that people really is, is well sought after and it sells out. That's all I care about, just sell it out. Um, yeah, so that's kind of it. But then Ken talks about retiring in 10 years. So we all need together an exit strategy. <laughs> so we talked about maybe we go to Provence and we make rosé together. And, and Jess and I are always like, we're included in that plan, right? Like we're all going. To Provence, right? <laughs> and then there's been talk of mezcal, and maybe we all go to Mexico and we make mezcal. But I don't think we'll stop, and I don't think we'll ever split up. Not for a while, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, but the heat is something that, that concerns all of us for sure. You know, seeing those fires, so the smoke come in the other night, I was like, oh, it's, it's, it's so recent. Mm -hmm. 2020 is so recent mm -hmm. that it gives you a little bit of those, oh gosh, feelings. Um, so that was interesting to see what that happened. And, and it's like, okay, so we, we kind of need a, a plan B, but it's gonna be a, a team plan B, I think, yeah. There's a lot of love with the Walter Scott family. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool, actually. It actually. is. It's really nice to hear. Yeah, that's, and that's kind of what my mum sees, I guess, with me being away. I'm like, I'm so sorry I found my people and they're on the other side of the world. She goes, but you are the happiest you've ever been. She's like, there's no way I could have you home and not let you do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty special. I think it's, it's not, not everyone gets to find that team, mm -hmm. sadly. But yeah, I feel very fortunate that I have. That's all the questions that I have for oh, you. Uh, <laughs> That's enough anything, talking anything for me. Anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that you'd I like to cover? I think so. Excellent. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. For your time, for sharing your stories with us and your, uh, and your thoughts on the future. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thank you. Thank you.